Oh, that's pretty, pretty cool. Uh, today is a great day. Uh, it's, a, it's a great way to start the semester. Uh, I hope you will enjoy it. Um, I want to do a quick introduction of our speaker, but before I want to thank uh, Cynthia Hodgson, our colleague and, and adjunct uh, faculty, uh, for coordinating all this and coordinating with Alex Rodriguez, who I will introduce in a little bit. Uh, this lecture by ABRDB here in FIU in Miami. Um, all of you are familiar with the work that ABRDB are doing. I just, I just spend some time these days looking at the website and looking at the work of NVRDB. And I was kind of like um, nostalgic about different times in my career when some of the projects were so relevant to me and they look so different and they, they, the, the idea of a practice that keeps surprising us and keeps the same standards by doing different things all the time it's, to me, it's, it's, it's an achievement because sometimes firms, especially when they're too big, they become kind of um, comfortable with the style. Mm -hmm. And they keep risking, and they keep uh, researching and doing new stuff. Um, I remember the days of uh, Soko that was mm. influential to my practice, and the Borneo housing, and the Hanover Pavilion, and so many projects. And recently, the Seoul project with the highway. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's just amazing to see the success of um, approaching different scales mm -hmm. from the urban to the detail. Because I know Jacob, you've been doing a lot of industrial design mm -hmm. too, and like small pieces, furniture, carpets, and things like that. And, um, and it's great because it's, it's always a challenge to keep that standard, to keep um, practice at that level uh, for so many years. Um, the office is based in Rotterdam, and um, in in the Netherlands, which is you know, a country that I have a great feelings for, because I used to live there for some time. And before I introduce Jacob, I want to invite Alex, who is one of our <laughs> former students that 20 years ago, maybe less, was sitting there. Not there, because this building didn't exist. <laughs> but at the end, just, um, so that you, know, you can hear from him. Um, more or less what his experiences have been this year. Alex, please. Thank you, Henry. Um, yeah, first I wanted to thank the Department of Architecture, I want to thank Cynthia, uh, also Charlotte for helping organize today's lecture and have Jakob come here all the way from Rotterdam. Um, as Henry said, I was a student here at FIU from 2001 to 2005, and I think it goes without saying that MBRDB was one of the firms that I and also a lot of my uh, colleagues and students were researching, looking for as a reference, um, and also kind of appreciating the sort of vision and innovation that was coming out of that office, especially in those years in the early 2000s. And so to sort of fast forward 20 years later to be now part of MDRDB as an associate is, you know, for me a privilege. But it's also, I think, um, due in part by the inspiration that I got studying here, sort of thanks to the professors and students who I was working with who really sort of pushed for us to think outside the box, to look what was happening outside of Miami and outside of the US to get inspiration and I think that learning experience for me was very crucial to find myself today living in Europe and working with NDRDB. So with that, I'm really happy to be here. I'm really happy to welcome Jakob uh, for his presentation. Yeah, okay, so let's just go. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Cynthia, everybody uh, involved. It's on. It's on, am I on? Okay, yeah. looks like it. And uh, yeah, for me, it's also cool to be here again Live with the lecture, it's the first. Uh, but, but before we start, we, I'm not. Uh, we, Alex is not the only one of the office here. We have Frans de Witte and Vanessa Kasabian. Actually, it's an interesting moment for us because we just started uh, our, our New York office, and Vanessa is leading that. Frans is one of our new partners in Rotterdam, but also heavily involved in our American adventures. Um, but I'm actually not really going to speak about that. I, I, I'm going to give you a little intro of our, our Dutch work, but also of, let's say, uh, um, other recent 
projects that form somehow a kind of uh, a series of projects about topics that I think are very relevant for, let's say, for you yeah, as, as uh, students in architecture at these interesting times. Um, but it's cool to be here in a space full of people again instead of a Zoom screen with all the little boxes and, and where people can. It, it, it's comfortable to have a lecture at, and uh, to follow a lecture in, in, in the Zoom. Uh, you can just do your cooking and everything. And, uh, to watch TV or whatever, you can do this multi, multiple things, so it's, it's slightly different when you have to sit here maybe and hear a long talk. Um, but hopefully it also inspires and, and we have potential uh, exchange afterwards in, some, in form of questions, so don't be shy uh, asking uh, some, some things. It's always a bit, uh, takes a bit time to, to step over and, and ask a question, so don't, but, but don't do that. I'm also teaching in a university in, in Berlin. Um, so I know a little bit what it's like, um, uh, but it's quite a different atmosphere, I have to say, coming over here to FIU when the university in, uh, the university in Germany. Okay, MVRDV, uh, um, we, um, yeah, we, we started with three, uh, together with Winnie and Natalie, uh, but it became more, more, let's say, a sort of a brand, and so this is part of this sort of branding operation, where the, 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 the letters can have different meanings, but they still stand for certain attitudes that that's, uh, is in, in our DNA, you could say, and, and a little, a sort of uh, mission statement that we came up with. Uh, so what, 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 what do we try to do? So we, we try to somehow make relevant projects, and, and, but also exciting and, and fun, uh, that, that are somehow um, are giving us solutions that maybe are not always um, the first solution that, that, that you think about, but somehow a sort of an element of surprise and sort of invention, that's what we, that we like to do on different scales. We don't want to choose, we don't want to select. Sometimes it's difficult to say no, uh, so that leads to a very wide portfolio and it's also very diverse. Um, and so we don't stick to a certain style. Maybe we have a certain chameleonistic um, approach. And um, yeah, S since this year, I think we will celebrate our 30th year anniversary. Um, and this is a picture of the 25th anniversary uh, at our first major building in, uh, uh, in the center of Holland. Um, and we revisited it, and some of the people on the picture were not even born when the building was, was designed. So uh, that's kind of, and then you say, oh my god, I'm getting old. But anyway, but it's still the, the mood yeah, the, and the average age of, of, the, of the studio uh, is more or less uh, stays the same. Yeah, that's sort of, we always we keep more or less 31.5 years old for, for, for um, so if you, the average age of the staff. Um, um, anyway, um, we have a, a bit of broader leadership. This is a picture from last. I think a few years ago when this building behind was just finished. Um, so we, yeah, it's, it's a big group, so that's 300 people and we organized ourselves in, in, in sort of studios uh, with a certain focus, are almost like offices in an office. Um, and yeah, it's, it's also needed because you, when you, you grow and, and um, yeah, you have to op somehow make your operations a bit more efficient, but not too efficient that, that, that you become a corporate firm which we try to avoid in a certain way, uh, but on the other hand, sometimes you have to act as if you are a corporate firm, so in order to get larger commissions. Um, where are we based? And this is a, a nice picture, black and white. You can see this is from uh, the end of the 40s, when Rotterdam was rebuilding after the war. And in these little uh, houses over here, these five houses, like M, V, R, D, V, this is uh, where we are, in a, in a kind of new a building that was just built, uh, let's say, to house all kind of companies that lost their space after the bombardment. Um, but right now, let's say 75 years later, this is a very exciting neighborhood uh, uh, and, and the building is still acting and, and, and functioning really well. So that's surprising. So we actually, I'm actually a real big fan of this building designed by uh, Maaskant, a Dutch architect. Uh, this is the distribution street and we are, this is the office over here. Um, we have palm trees in Rotterdam as well. And, um, and over here you see that this is a, a sort of building with galleries, that, what you normally expect, like a housing uh, block with, with walk -up, uh, walkways. But this is actually a uh, function as an office building, so it's a very social space and you meet other colleagues from other firms. So it's really like, a crea you could say, a creative hub. And when we moved in here, uh, yeah, we, we also decided to really design our own, uh, our own office, because normally architects, yeah, we, you start somewhere, you buy some furniture, uh, and you don't really care how it looks like. Um, uh, but uh, it became a bit too, too crappy, so to say. So it's like, now we're moving in, let's make something exciting and, and make it work. So this is the story in a bit, so it's, it's, we like diagrams. Um, uh, this is a little, like three doll's houses, the, the middle of the five houses, where the meeting rooms are. So you step out of your office world, your desk, your computer, and you, you talk to some people 
uh, now you have some screens and zooms, but that, that's a busy, so then you step into a different, different color or you have a client meeting. Um, so we like monochrome spaces and here we have a collection of, of, of colors that we can actually test and test the mood and the atmosphere. We have our little tribune, a big table where we have lunch and, and so this is the sort of atmosphere that, that, that we still try to ma maintain throughout the years, it's sort of an informal uh, base. Um, and, all right, around, around the office, like, let's say two, three minutes away from our office is this building. So we're really in the center of the city and, and this building marks a kind of step in the development of the firm where it was well uh, received and, and published all over the world. And so and, and where people said, okay, these guys can do interesting, complex, but also commercial uh, projects. And, and after this building was finished, we, we grew quite a lot. So this is the market hall uh, in the center of town. Um, Dutch uh, Rotterdam is a, a modern city, so maybe uh, this is not a typical Dutch city be because of the bombardment. Uh, so it has it maybe it's almost yeah, the most American Dutch city, you could say. But there's not that many uh, um, apartments in that in the center of town, so the city decided to have a competition where they wanted to combine the market and market foothold together with uh, apartment ha uh, housing. Um, and we proposed uh, an, an these two arches of build uh, two. two um, I say slabs that we connected at the top um, and created a big building at this um, new uh, plaza that, that was that yeah, some of you were in Rotterdam before and Henry explained it to me that he was uh, driving past uh, the cube houses over here um, which is now not possible anymore because the train is underground um, but then that, re that, that made this, this central space in the city suddenly uh, yeah, a, a new plaza and these buildings could get an address, a larger scale address on that space. Um, so here, the typical starting point, there were two slabs and a market in between. By flipping it up um, and, and bending it into the right shape, uh, we created a large in internal space um, over here. So the, this is all about the section, you could say. And this huge cubic amount of cubic meters was the, the, the sort of urban living room uh, that we offered um, the city of Rotterdam. And that, that, that element made, uh, yeah, made us win the competition. For the rest of these standards, uh, the base of the building is actually a kind of efficient housing scheme with an additional, let's say, penthouse layer on top. And the signature section actually is the, is the logo of the building as well. It's very recognizable. Many people visit it from different places, so let's say from local to global. It's on the on the tours of the, of the, of the international uh, visitors as well. Um, and of course you see this interior space with this amazing uh, art piece from a local artist, Arno Kuhne. Um, initially our, our, our dream was to make it into a giant LED screen that was too, uh, too, too let's say, too costly. Um, so there was a competition about, about yeah, to make a, a beautiful internal space. And uh, here you, you could enter, you could say, from the, the basement up where the car park is, and then you enter right in the middle uh, and you could look up and you see almost like yeah, fruit and vegetables falling from heaven on you. Uh, so that's the effect that you, you see. Uh, and, and, in, and then you see some windows there, uh, that people actually living in this behind the space, behind the big raspberry. Uh, uh, you could say, well, that's why my heart this, gives this atmosphere, uh, um, yeah, unique atmosphere from, for, for, for the food market itself. And, but, but as well, it becomes a lantern for the city. Here an impression of some of the apartments. So they have an external side and an internal side, and it's almost like a like an aquarium, so to say, where you uh, yeah you see that you don't hear the market, but you see this this colorful image. Sometimes it's super busy, sometimes it's more relaxed. You have actually the possibility to have uh, a dinner or lunch on top of the stalls, and and of course there's an outdoor food market, an, an outdoor market, a daily a weekly market, and then there's the, the daily food market in the building. Of course, for the climate, for us, it's not as as warm as, as, it, as it's here, it's quite wet and windy, so then it's very comfortable to have this uh, collective indoor space. Some impressions uh, where the building is. Um, it's a bit of a mess, you could say, what in terms of architectural style, you see here a kind of a bit of Sainte Pompidou-like uh, uh, high-tech building, you see a classical building, you have the cube houses, the, the, the cathedral. So that is in a way the, 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 the center of Rotterdam. It's not as, as consistent as, as I noticed here in Miami where all the buildings have the same color, uh, uh, that you immediately spot uh, uh, yeah, this, this have a couleur locale, but here in Rotterdam this diversity you could say is maybe typical for, for this city. Um, I'd I first like to show a few, let's say, Dutch projects. Maybe let's say the, 
you know, the classics. Um, this project was realized a couple of years ago, it's very, uh, in, also in Rotterdam, Art Depot, and uh, this is the Municipal Museum. Um, it's not only modern art, but it's actually a lot of stuff from design, from old paintings, uh, arts and crafts stuff, so it's a really uh, a, 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 a exciting and interesting collection. And, um, but they had a, a, they had a problem. Uh, this is the director of the museum. Um, there were issues with water, and, and it's not only yet, in, in every, there's more cities that have that. And when it when was a heavy downfall, uh, the, the basement would, uh, would flood. And that was also part of where uh, some of the storage of the art pieces were there, of the collection. So it was, uh, there was an urgent issue. And this picture uh, made that clear. There were storage rooms outside the city, uh, but not that, yeah, they're safe but they're not very nice. Um, so the dream they had was to say, okay, let's combine the storage uh, in a building that could be accessible, would be safe and exciting, and almost next to the, to the, to the, to the museum itself. And you, almost like this, you have a digital archive of all the art pieces that are in the collection. But normally you have only, let's say, 10% of this collection that you actually have, uh, that, you, that, that hangs in the museum. Some pieces are never visible. So yeah, you can see them on, online, but in the in the real archive, it would be nice to yeah to to see them re in reality. So you can actually uh, look for certain pieces that are normally uh, yeah, invisible, so to say. This, so we had a bit of an idea like this, like a wunderkammer, like a sort of a piece, a building packed with with the most exciting, weird, and wonderful uh, uh, objects, and and the kind of combination of that would be really fantastic to experience. So this is, you see here the center of Rotterdam. There's some museum cluster where this building should be located. Actually, it's the museum park. And over here, there's a building of OMA, a Kunsthal. There's a hospital, there's a couple of other cultural institutions, and there's a beautiful park. So it's, it, was, it was a sensitive um, site, uh, especially because there's, there's not that many public parks in the center of Rotterdam. So there was immediately some, so we knew this is going to be hard to uh, defend for, like, for the neighborhood committee um, as uh, local architects in this case. Normally we work outside, the, outside our city, but this is more or less our home, home turf. So we knew that it, could be, uh, it would be a sensitive topic. Uh, but we also knew what, what, what we could offer as well, what we could bring. The most complicated issue was that it was a lot of cubic meters of space, yeah, the big box, high ceilings. Um, the volume couldn't go underground because that was the whole issue. Right? That, that was a water issue, uh, so no basement, so it was there. And by making it uh, round, it would already be less bulky. Yeah, so uh, instead of a box, a cylinder would help. And the next step would get, if you push it a bit, uh, reduce it a bit in the, in, in, at the bottom, at the place of impact, so to say, it would also be less, less visible. Uh, and, and as a bonus, we could actually make the top a bit wider. And, and create a platform there, so that we would give something extra, that we give something back more than, than, than we would take by, then the footprint of the building is smaller than the roof. And positioning it in such a way that this, the view lines to the museums and the institutions that are there already would not be blocked. So it was, there was a clear um, um, site that was available. And then the idea, what, what could we do to make it even less, uh, less let's say, impactful? And the, the most easy one is then to make it into a mirror, then you, it reflects the surrounding and it becomes almost invisible. And because it was then curved, the, the, yeah, some funny effects, some funny side effects uh, came along so that you could look around the corner. So that the, you, you would actually spot something that you would normally not see. So if you come along the street, you would see the park already reflected in the, in the building, uh, the new building. Um, and that's, that's the plan. So here we would create an, an additional green space on top reflecting the surrounding, and that was the story. And yeah, of course we, you, you, could, you can imagine it, but in, the, in reality it's even more exciting to see that reflecting, the reflectiveness. And the sun, of course, it's, it's a bit uh, overhanging, so the, if there, if there's no real issue with uh, sunlight. Um, and it's, the inside of the building is a big, yeah, it's a big storage box, basically, but not completely. There's a, there's a beautiful atrium that we sort of carved out, not too wide because it's in. Otherwise, the building would be even larger, and that would make this route from the from the park up to the roof park to the roof deck uh, possible. And this could be, let's say, the fast track visit. From uh, you have the, the slow track, uh, the slow walk, and you have the, the the quick visits. So the building itself, it's it's a very logistic and efficient design. 
this is a storage box, and the, the, the building itself is not a cheap building, but it's peanuts compared to the, to the value of the art. The, the value of the art pieces would be a multitude of the building costs. So issues like safety and, and security for uh, uh, art pieces entering, and there were some burglaries in museums for people stealing Van Gogh paintings and that kind of thing. So it, this is really a bunker, you could say. But it doesn't look like that. But so behind behind uh, the, the scenes, so to say, there's a whole operational uh, facility. Here, are people waiting and entering in the in the lobby, and from there on, you can look up to the sky. And it's almost like a Pyrenean space. We thought it would be work best when we with, that the architecture would be neutral, sort of grey, uh, mirrory, glassy, and that all all the art would sort of shine out and stand out from that color palette of the building. So the first impression you have, you see look, people looking like this. So it is an overwhelming visual experience uh, um, at the same time, um, um, because it, you don't expect it. And you see this kind of um, mirror ball from the outside, and then you come inside, and there is this sort of mystery, uh, mysterious mystery world. So up, and in this central atrium, you, you, you go up floor by floor, and there's kind of shopping windows where you can look into uh, the storage halls. You see the, the restoration atelier. And some of the ex collection is then on, on display in these uh, glass boxes. Uh, so you, ha you get a cross section of um, um, what's the section. Um, but what is m most exciting is that you take a long tour and you get this white jacket on and you can select, uh, yeah, you have a private view, so to say. So you can say, oh, I'd like to, have to, I'd like to see that painting. And then uh, the staff of the museum, of the depot, they, they, they walk there and they open it for you so you can, you can look exclusively at that art piece. You can also see the back side of it, so that's, that's really exciting. The restoration atelier, here you see that, that storage spaces. And, um, so it's a totally different experience of, of a, in a traditional museum, um, but it is at the same time yeah, an, an enriching experience, uh, in, let's say, uh, to visit the collection. So on top uh, we created an, 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 oops, sorry. <laughs> uh, a small exposition space and a restaurant and of course the, the roof deck. So here we put extra attention on, because this was one of the topics that was uh, important for the neighbors and the people in the city, that the part that we would kind of occupy would, uh, would be replaced in, in a serious way. So here a thick roof package of more than one meter earth, uh, and again a reflective roof pavilion. So when you walk around on the roof, you really don't see the building anymore. You see the surrounding and you see the trees. So you really have a feeling that you are in, in a park uh, at the height of the, let's say, the middle height of the city. The restaurant and outside, uh, the, let's say, the plaza of the museum also becomes part of the uh, experience. Here's an art piece of Pipilotti Ries that's reflecting from the facade and then onto the uh, pavement again. And the same roof design, the same species that are on the roof come back on the, on the ground. So next project also in Holland, so uh, this is the third um, building that, that we recently finished. It's called the Valley. It's an, uh, a housing and it's a mixed use building in, in the, in the, at the edge of the city of Amsterdam near the central business district. And, and yeah, we had a dream to make some uh, uh, can't I say, we, uh, uh, possibility of, of making a European skyscraper. So it's not, it's not, it was not possible to make a very high building. It was 100 meters high, it's not low, but there was a maximum height. And we thought it would be interesting to, to, uh, to create an additional quality uh, of, of high rises. So here you see the, the Ring of Amsterdam. It's not too far from the airport. It's a business district. And here you see the, the building. Let me first explain it a little bit more. A big sport complex that was uh, already one of the oldest soccer clubs in uh, Amsterdam. Here there are all, let's say, mostly offices, uh, some housing here and there, a big, uh, and a big ring of, uh, of, of the city of Amsterdam. The massing and the, the program is like this. There's a plinth with uh, some shopping, offices on the first, let's say, the, 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 the lower part of the building, and then three residential um, uh, towers on top of that. But they merge into one, let's say, a sculptural uh, composition, you could say. Um, exterior facade is inspired by the, by the offices that are, let's say, already there in the surroundings. So it's a kind of efficient, active. Uh, Glazing glazed facade, and then the inside is then this more or less, yeah, the, the, as contrasting as possible, uh, a kind of stony, rocky, um, a bit personalized, um, um, yeah, vertical um, a residential valley. Um, over here, oops, sorry. 
here a little bit in detail. On top of one of the highest, the, the highest tower is a, a sky bar, and, and it's possible to actually walk around the street up to the, to, the, to the first deck, to the first roof deck. And what we did is that we, we tried to find a reasoning, a sort of um, sculptural program, you could say, to uh, organize the best shape, the best shape possible for the apartments, so that, that they would have the right view, uh, sun, uh, privacy, uh, protection from wind and noise, and uh, an outdoor space. And this we, we organized, uh, this more or less was a first model in a sort of intuitive way by, um, by sculpting a piece of foam. Um, and later on we uh, did something in a similar way, but then in a, in a, in a, in a digital format. So more, this was the dream, and, and we tested the same uh, principle, but then by, by using all kinds of parameters of how much light do the, do the uh, apartments have, um, how much sun hours, um, do they, uh, do they, is there a certain amount of shade uh, or not, is it protected from the wind, from the noise, there's special regulations. So all this, the hard, the hard data and the hard regulations we put into a 3D uh, parametric model, and this was, op this, they optimized the, um, the outcome of it. So here, a quick movie of that this parametric program would find for us the best, uh, the best shape, so to, so to say. And similarly, uh, you can do that for uh, one tower, you can do that for the whole building. And out of this, let's say, pre-collection pre of potential buildings, we then uh, took the best one and kind of refined it even more in detail. So here you see all the floors of one tower. And you could say every floor is different, but of course the, the basic structure is very straightforward by just extending the, the main structural walls and then yeah, the, you could create different facades uh, per floor and then the, the building you would, yeah, could look like this. Of course it's easily said and done, but uh, also the cladding, uh, the whole detailing of the cladding was, was treated in a similar way that we optimized, let's say, we made, made a, a program for the, the panelization of the, of the stone facade and the ceilings so that the, yeah, the, the gaps between the stones would not overlap and that sort of yeah, complete three-dimensional uh, uh, detailing would occur. Here you see that more office-like exterior facade, the, the base of the building's offices and then goes up. Here you see then uh, loggias appear where the apartments start. And you could say you have a sky villa, you have a, an apartment with a big outdoor space quite close to the, to the center. Um, so you would say it, it combines suburban living with vertical living. Uh, so you have um, your own private deck, uh, but also the compactness of, a, of an apartment. With a large outdoor space, with a garden. So this was then, uh, there's, a, there's some gardeners in the building. Um, the plantation is all taken care of, um, watering as well. This, uh, the selection of the plant was done by Pete Oudhoff, the same landscape architect as the High Line in New York. And, uh, so you have this amazing, yeah, let's say, inter interior world, which is a little bit protected from the, from the, the busyness of the, of the highway. Uh, you can see sometimes your neighbor, but you don't have to see them all the time. Um, and below, in the, looking down, you have the, the office part where you have an internal grotto, uh, a street connecting the uh, workspaces with a window to the top. Um, so this is, let's say, the deck where uh, that, uh, above the retail splint. And on top of the office part, you have this uh, yeah, internal, uh, yeah, external route from the street up, to almost like a small mountain path to the to the decks, to the collective decks uh, between the towers. So here, that's a walkway all the way down to the um, to the sidewalk. Um, so this is actually public, so you, uh, it's it's not blocked. So it's a kind of vertical street. We don't have, uh, yeah, everything is flat in the Netherlands, so this is an exciting mountain walk. Uh, if you are in Amsterdam, you could pass by and walk up and down again, have coffee. Um, so it's, it's a building that is contextual, but it's also unique uh, in its appearance um, and very recognizable, of course. But uh, what's quite su surprising is that it, how it lands in the street, in the city, it somehow doesn't feel enormous because it's, um, yeah, it kind of tapers up. And, um, it looks actually quite um, yeah, modest at the same time. So yeah, um, we were super happy that we received an, uh, the, the award for the best skyscraper in the world. So it's not about height anymore, uh, when you make skyscrapers. It's more about 
um, quality of uh, the architecture and the design and the, the, the life that you could have in collective spaces. So here is, that was the, the list that was made last year. And, and, uh, the lowest one uh, was the, on, ended on the, on the top. Yeah. Um, actually, so the, the, the first, uh, this, this, this project was an attempt to, um, to make a, a, a European skyscraper. So um, recently we started with a project in uh, Guayaquil in Ecuador where we could say maybe we, could, we, we, could, we should try to make a Latin skyscraper. And what can we, uh, how can, can we try to, um, to have maybe it's partly similar, it's, not, it's, it's related in a certain way, but it's also uh, different. Um, we do this for um, an exciting developer, um, Uribe Swartzkop from Quito. And um, they have been working with many international architects. And this was their first, uh, the first project in uh, Guayaquil, uh, which is uh, bigger than Quito, but it's a city that lacks a certain um, identity. You could say on first sight, there's a huge river, but the potential of the, let's say, the location is, yeah, they're starting to develop that, so to say. Um, you, yeah, you could see that they, they, this, could, this is a building that could be in Miami, yeah, but you say a bit, a bit white and glass. And, but, and, but at the same time, you have this uh, yeah, potential malancon, this route along the river that they are developing already uh, a couple of decades. And every, let's say, few years, they, they add a, another part. And right now, uh, we are talking about this plot, plot over here. And we thought it would be interesting to, to see how could we make uh, yeah, contextual um, design here. So we have, of course, this uh, sort of international white style, uh, modern style, versus the more, uh, let's say, informal uh, urbanity behind, and which is actually exciting as well. So the contrast, which is this is really next next to each other, we found very 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 cool. And yeah, you can take pictures like this. So these two worlds combine uh, in one picture. So this, for us, was a way to, to, to look for um, a solution for, for a design that, that could combine these two things. A certain uh, smoothness and coolness versus this informal, uh, uh, more natural uh, um, uh, sort of um, design aspect. So we did test different directions. And in, in the end, in, uh, with some dialogue, which is always good that you have dialogue with your client during the design, and not instead of a competition, so it was a competition, but with an additional uh, dialogue round, where we, where we found out that actually this combination was, was very interesting. So indeed, looking at views, but also looking at the sort of um, integration of, of nature uh, to combine these two into one. So then this was the model that we developed further. And it's a series of diagrams over here, uh, optimizing views, um, uh, but also wind, and, 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 and at the same time, this idea of uh, that, the, that, the, that the towers would dissolve into the air, the natural gradient, and adding then a series of terraces with um, um, vegetation. Further, more details on context, uh, sunlight, wind, the, more, the most common wind. And so that this information was then put into the, the final design, and this is the, what, what it could look like. So on the outside, this kind of uh, uh, panoramic horizontal windows, and on the inside is more organic and, and earth tones uh, with more curvatures. This is, so it's again like, like uh, the, the building in Amsterdam is one a total volume at the same time when you live inside you have this you're part of a vertical um, uh, a vertical uh, city you could say the, the the atmosphere that we like to have so it would go from dark from earth tones to to sky a very let's say um, in, uh, regular but also quite contextual uh, exterior facade that that connects to the uh, to the buildings that are already there and uh, irregular and curvy inside with ceramic material and vegetation. And of course you have then uh, if almost a full, um, a full panorama balcony that sometimes is a bit wider, sometimes a bit less, sometimes it's, it's outside completely to the top, partly covered. It could act as a certain filter for, from between inside and outside. And sometimes I yeah, hear some impressions of the materials and looking from the back through the other towers to the river and connecting it to the, the Malacom, the, the, the river, the river uh, uh, promenade, which is now extended um, along the Guaya River. So um, what's ex exciting to see as well is that the indoor world, we, we really, yeah, this could be a, a kind of, it's like Miami, the vegetation is could, could be fantastic here. Everything grows, you could say. So this, these small valleys and, and, and niches and canyons uh, will bolster the collective program 
uh, where you have the pools and the decks. This is something that, that's familiar to you, I think. Uh, when, when I drive around Miami, you see many of these um, plinths with kind of pools on top and palms and then condos. Um, so it's, it's partly inspired by that lifestyle, you could say. Um, and it's, but it also tries to make something extra, give something extra back to the city by giving uh, a plinth that's accessible and you, a street that you can enter. Um, up to a certain height uh, until, let's say, the, the, the more secure part of the collective spaces for the residents uh, take over. Here are some impressions from streets level. This is the the, uh, the internal street in the mall between uh, the towers and the main entrance from the street side, from the city side, where, let's say, the, uh, the terracotta takes over from the, from the aluminium uh, white facade. So that's the, that's the story. We are already starting with construction with the foundations at the moment. So it'll take a while, but I think are moving in the Guayaquil. I can't wait to see the results. Um, yeah, there's some sales offices that, that, that it, it landed quite well. People are excited too that this, this type of uh, buildings could come to, uh, to Guayaquil. So they, um, they're happy with the, the reception uh, in, of, the, of the architecture. But it's okay, let's move on to uh, the second part of the lecture. I think it would be nice to speak a bit about uh, what, are, what are relevant topics for architects these, these days in construction and uh, so what, what, what should we think about? Eh? So we, we all know the big issues and uh, architecture and construction industry play a big role in the whole, uh, um, let's say, uh, development and the production of CO2. But at the same time, there's these all kinds of new technologies appearing. So I think it's a super interesting time to, to study architecture. Uh, and same in our office, we, we, we also discuss what direction, what, is, what is, are, the, are the relevant topics and what should we do different. And, uh, so I, I would like to show you a couple of things that we are discussing in the office, also uh, a series of, let's say, more research-driven um, projects. Um, but you could, you could say that, that yeah, of course, it's all, it deals with energy, it deals with the, the right materials, it could be used with uh, uh, reuse of materials, and of course, making resilient spaces and collective spaces that can adapt to the climate, climatological changes. So these, of course, are, yeah, it's almost a no-brainer, you could say, but still um, super uh, relevant to include as much as possible in each project. Sometimes it doesn't go to, let's say, the perfect way, but you still, you could, you, you still should try to go to the max, and in certain projects you have much more possibilities than others. Sometimes it's a small project, and you can do, have a lot of freedom, and you can really test out uh, certain ideas. Sometimes it's a big project, but it could also have a big win. Uh, even a modest improvement could have a big effect. Um, so in, in our office, we we, uh, we try to combine, let's say, the, the, the let's say the, the, you could say certain people that are really good at, at computing and but also in um, uh, sustainability. So that these these two worlds combine, and that we use this collective intelligence uh, to develop tools and, and solve problems for certain uh, design. Issues. So different groups, different project teams can knock on the door of this unit, and then they, uh, yeah, step in, work with their smartness. Uh, certain it can it can be on any scale. It can be on the scale of the detail. It can be on the urban scale. It can be on structure. It can be on uh, let's say uh, um, wind or roofs or whatever thing. So I'd like to show you uh, an ex a recent project that we developed um, called Roofscape. We have something with roofs. I'll show you some uh, some details. Um, of installations, um, but this is a study that we did for the city of Rotterdam initially, um, combining, let's say, um, the data sets of, of, of kind of GIS data of the, of the volume of the city, the, uh, the, the age of the buildings, the scale of the buildings, uh, or how the angles of the roofs are. So the, there's a 3D model of the city, and, and with that model we can then s discover and find out potentials for roof, the use, use of the roof, and like. Other cities, Rotterdam, they're, they're really thinking about how to make the city more resilient, how to th have issues like urban heating, uh, but also energy, the fact that you can make a sort of sponge city, that, that when, it, when there's a heavy downfall, that, that all the water is not immediately coming to the streets. So all that, that, that topics, yeah, everybody knows that it's an issue, but what can we do about it? So here we have this um, recipe where we can say, well, what are the potential uh, usage for the roof, you could say it can be, of course, green. You can have energy, solar panels. You could, but you can also have a, a nice uh, public roof, or um, sometimes it can be um, um, a, a space where people can um, um, meet, or it can be a space where you have access. Um, 
So this, these elements you, you could combine. I'm not going to go too much in detail, but so there's a lot of data sets that you can overlap. And out of this information, you could select then, uh, you could say, see potential spots where certain things could happen. So this is a kind of a, an interactive tool where you can say, I want to have a certain scale for a roof. I want to have a certain function. What would be the best spot in the city? So it's for urban planners, you could say, but also for maybe for developers and architects to, to see where um, yeah, what this, could, uh, this additional, additional potential for future development could, could happen. Where can I put green roofs? Uh, and that's sometimes on a building uh, that the structure is very good. Sometimes it's an, it's an old building that doesn't really work or it's too small. Uh, or, and you can have the ownership. Is it a publicly owned building or is it a co-housing corporation? Or, all that information is in that, in that model. And yeah, so this is a sort of next step from the, the project we did before, which is the rooftop catalog, where we, as designers, imagined all the potential uh, usage of, of roofs um, in a more, let's say, a visual way. Um, so uh, that, that's, yeah, the, the additional, let's say, uh, ground level is on the roof. And I saw a lot of interesting palm, palm trees on roof decks here as well. So I think something is happening here, here too. And the, the next issue, of course, is say the, 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 the climatic topic that we like to involve, of course, like everybody else. Something is, is, is happening and we have to, as, as the greenhouse effect is developing further, the, the, the carbon impact of buildings, that is really important. So right now, the many green labels of architecture, they deal with energy and the performance of buildings, but it's much more important as well to look at the, the amount of CO2 that it comes free uh, when you build the building, but also when the building is running. So this we, we like to use as well as a design component. And it can some, be very interesting in the design stage already to think if solution A or solution B uh, is better, not just because it looks better, but it might be better because it has less uh, CO2 impact. Um, more and more development, of course, in wooden construction. Um, we did a small pavilion in uh, Germany with uh, robots, uh, paramedic wooden uh, milling uh, techniques. You see a lot of recycling solutions. This is another German project where we use uh, bricks from other buildings and uh, recycled plastic tiles um, to make the new facade. Um, so these bricks come from uh, kind of, yeah, there's, uh, there's certain companies that collect them, clean them, and then you can buy. They're, of course, a bit more expensive. Depending on what's available, uh, yeah, you can see this kind of geological layers in the facade, depending on where the bricks are coming from. Same for the, for the plastic. Uh, that's actually a Dutch uh, architecture company that started this product and it's doing really well. Um, made out of uh, plastic waste, depending on the type of waste, the color of the tile is slightly different. Um, okay, then of course energy, another topic. We design buildings where, uh, which have certain energy roofs. We could see how we can optimize that, maybe get, use the shade, use the sun, and use the energy, in this case in uh, China, for a uh, building. And adapting the, the climate issues, we finished recently uh, a project in uh, Vancouver, C2 City. And of course, with our Dutch issues with water, yeah, uh, this is another thing. So besides the rooftop catalog, we have our um, climate catalog, uh, where you have the sea level uh, topics combined. Here's uh, some images of that project, how we can make future-proof uh, development of urban spaces and city development um, more relevant. So these, of course, are long-term and maybe more uh, speculative projects, but of course be, they will become more and more, um, let's say, um, important for us as designers. Um, Circularity, it's another it's a big issue. How can we make buildings that can be transformed? How can we make them in such a way that you can recycle the buildings, the, the materials, that you know what exactly is, is existing in the building? How can you then, uh, let's say, improve uh, the lifespan, but also improve the possibility to recycle the materials? Uh, of course, we have an incredible amount of, of building, building stock that we can reuse instead of Im immediately demolishing, demolishing it. Uh, we, we think it's super cool to find solutions for existing buildings that, uh, yeah, that, that are unexpected. And I've learned in, in a couple of projects that the more ugly the building is, the more potential it has to be transformed. This is a structure in uh, Shenzhen in China of an urban factory where we actually, we didn't really change the design that much. So we kept the structure, I mean, we basically peeled it off, adding a new facade uh, slightly inside so you can walk, away, walk around. 
and reinforcing the top layer so that it can, could be a big uh, roof garden, which the, so that the weight of the roof garden would be, uh, the building could hold that. And um, instead of, and you see that they, oh, there's, a, there's a change of mindset also in uh, cities like Shenzhen where this would be demolished a couple of years ago and now they realize, hey, maybe we could do something with it and, and, and the result could be even more, more exciting. So that's the ID factory. And this is a really fascinating, let's say, urban typologies, the urban villages uh, that were not, they were in a way, uh, yeah, you, could say, you could say high density villages, part of Shenzhen, but also uh, they have their own, let's say, village like, um, yeah, it's a small neighborhood, so to say, but super dense, and where, let's say, living and working and production were, were, that is combined. Yeah, many of these villages are demolished and then replaced when, um, by high rises. Um, but more and more, um, uh, yeah, they try to keep them somehow and see what we can optimize and, and a more organic transformation process, which of course takes more effort, but, but it could also be a, a much more exciting and interesting in the long run. So that's the building. This is how it looks right now. So it becomes a creative district uh, where these tiny streets suddenly, uh, and this, this transformation, in this whole process is then uh, steering a direction where, where yeah, more, more companies and more people like to go here and suddenly this whole uh, rather unnoticed uh, urban village becomes the hot spot of the city. And the, the roof of course was crucial for this, for this uh, idea so we thought okay let's, let's make it as, as green as possible. This is also quite a warm place and not that much green in that part of the city. So it has a, has a kind of series of rooms, outdoor spaces with different activities we invented the whole catalog and discussed with the client potential, yeah, so it can be fitness, it can be uh, reading, it can be uh, jumping, whatever, playing chess. So this, this is uh, the best ones were selected and, and placed on the, in between, let's say, the, the beams of the roof and then on the in between spaces, the, the green, uh, the, the bamboo plants were added and, and they were actually on the structural lines of the, of the, of the roof. So here you are outdoor, but still uh, with the kind of shaded protection of the, of the green. So it's a little maze of the, where you could go and um, accessible by a big staircase from the street all the way up, punching out and going back to the top. This is the section all the way there. Yeah. And the building itself, yeah, it's very straightforward. Uh, floors, walkways, and can be divided in small units and bigger units. So it's a very flexible um, uh, layout. And this one, yeah, I think we could, this could be a, a recipe that you could repeat because this build, these type of buildings, this, this are, yeah, there are many of them. And uh, we thought it would, yeah, it could be an inspiration for other uh, owners of uh, factories like this. And here basically we didn't add a facade, we just took the facade away and we kept the naked structure uh, intact uh, as a new facade. With the exception of the in inside, the sort of super spacey stairway all the way up uh, with reflections of, of, yeah, it's a kind of tunnel. And we, we also discovered that from neighboring buildings, the, this is a roof of a neighboring building, here's theater performances would take place in the building itself. Uh, so, so unexpected uh, side effects would happen. And that's, uh, another project I'd like to discuss is the, uh, it's also in Shenzhen. It's under construction at the moment and it's a transformation of a, a high rise that's only 20 years old. Um, and it was finished in 2002, uh, but it was already, yeah, uh, no, it was, yeah, only in use for 15 years. And then it was clear that it was, it was a bad building basically, but built in a boom uh, of construction in the 90s and the uh, early 2000s when Shenzhen was over. It's yeah, an incredible, uh, growth, but the quality was of course not that important. So this is uh, in a way a kind of prototypical transformation for all these normal um, rather ugly uh, towers that are uh, around the world. Um, so this is what it looked like. Well, the issue with this is that, that the ceilings were a bit, the, the floor to ceiling height was a bit too low. Uh, the materials were rather outdated. Uh, the surface and the, the mechanical ventilation wasn't really working very well. Um, so it was a failure. And, and on top of that, the, the fire brigade of Shenzhen didn't approve the hotel that was on top because it was unsafe for the es escapeways. So basically a big disaster. So normally you would say, let's get rid of the building, forget about it and start all over again. 
and not our client and us. We said, okay, let's see the op let's try the opposite way first. See if we can find a way uh, to uh, trans transform this building and make it exciting again. So that was a bit of a yeah. The, the bar was high because it was such an ugly duck, um, and as it was a building for. Um, for, let's say, for children as well, we, we made this kind of series of diagrams explaining uh, the concept of the building. So this is, you can, you can read along. Uh, so we stipped it, uh, then we can say, uh, take it apart, but also um, um, yeah, keep, the, keep the core, keep the Casco alive, and, and try to make it exciting again. Adding colors and, uh, and vibes from the surrounding, and, and reflect that in a facade, a new facade that would extend it on top of the existing structure that would increase the performance of the building, uh, but also increase the, the looks of the building. So the performance, I mean in energy performance. Adding some public facilities. You see there's a hotel on top, offices in the middle, some retail and shopping and, and children's museum, and um, some facilities for um, family um, issues. Um, let's call it like this. Um, so, that then, but so it's a public, a public facility in the city and a public roof on top to uh, look on top, look around. So the building design, it has this kind of lens-like shape, uh, heavy columns, um, and what we added was this additional one meter 20 uh, layer of um, sun shading uh, to, to reduce the sun impact of the building, and, um, and also, you, and also this, the, that the glass could be more clear again. So uh, open more windows, more natural ventilation, it's not that, it's not rocket science. Um, and together with our, our, um, our next team, our, our um, computational team, we developed this um, detailing and color scheme uh, to create a sort of yeah, irregular, slightly dazzling effect from more colorful at the bottom, certain elements that needed an additional color so that you can orientate, but not, it's not a literal diagram of colors, but it's more intuitive, so to say. So that was the the result and impressions on the inside and the outside go quickly. And here we are today. And this is how it looks like. And during the pandemic, one of our uh, Chinese partners, uh, Wen Chen Xi, she went uh, two weeks in quarantine in, in China to go to the, to the building site, test the models, test the mock-up, and did some lighting tests. But the most important thing I, I mean, you could say is that we, uh, we saved an incredible amount of grey energy. It's uh, uh, 24,000 cubic meters of concrete. Uh, that equals um, uh, almost 10 million kilos of CO2, which is around well, almost 12,000 flights Amsterdam Shenzhen. So, yeah, sometimes, I'm, I'm, like here, I have to fly from Amsterdam to, to Miami, which is then around one cubic meter of concrete that I have to save somewhere else in the world. Um, um, the facade, it's, it's almost finished on the outside, but we're still working at, on the inside at the moment. And it has this, uh, yeah, really, it really has a big impact on the surroundings, this colorful facade. Uh, people are happy already, even though the building is still um, not open to, to public. And this is, yeah, the render and the, and the reality. This is, uh, Going on to existing buildings, I think yeah, we have already quite a collection of, uh, of interesting solutions for um, interesting, yeah, rather, uh, unattractive structures. The Japanese silos is a building we, we finished uh, 15 years ago uh, in Copenhagen. Um, two grain silos um, were the, the city wanted to keep them and um, uh, as a kind of part of a new uh, harbor district. There was a competition that you could add floors inside and make apartments in these silos. But our idea was slightly different. Instead of making them inside, we thought it would be much cooler to have them on the outside so that you have more, more panoramic views, because if you make windows in the existing silos, you could only make these tiny windows, otherwise the whole thing would collapse. So that was the story. It was really a, a challenge to get it built, but the result was, uh, yeah, you had this fantastic panorama with large, large um, outdoor terraces that would not be, have been possible if you had the solution, uh, uh, the traditional solution of the apartments on the inside. Uh, so you have these two silos, quite a banana-shaped uh, apartments, and an additional uh, layer of e external spaces. There was a maximum amount of square meters, so we, we had this enormous empty space available in the middle, um, which we kept as empty as possible, uh, only circulation, and it's kind of a spacey, uh, spacey lobby. 
and with a contrast to the outside over here. Yeah. Um, that's a small in-between. Uh, one recent project, again, dealing with tra transformation is this building in uh, Lyon. A uh, transformation of a 70s uh, shopping center, a big monster in the center, uh, in the new uh, business part of, of Lyon. It's a huge uh, development. Um, it's, they're still adding buildings, but it's, it's, yeah, you could see it as not extremely appealing, but it's, it's the business area. So there's high rises and you see many ugly buildings. And in the middle, an enormous complex, uh, which was at that time inspired by the American malls. I have a big shopping mall in Lyon. It was the biggest in Europe at the time, and um, with a certain charm, you could say. Yeah, it's a modern, it's kind of brutalistic architecture. Um, people are now trying to, to yeah, there's an interesting momentum. People want to yeah, have fans of brutalistic architecture and people that hate it. But I try to, yeah, let's, let's try to keep these, these brutalistic buildings uh, as much as possible. I think it's an interesting time. It won't come back. There won't, there won't be as, as heavy concrete buildings uh, in the future anymore. So the ones that we built in, the, in these era, in these times, it's somehow interesting to keep them from a cultural perspective. Um, this is how it looked. Um, yeah, not fantastic, but with a certain. It's immediately clear uh, that it is uh, in Lyon, and it is uh, Lyon Pardieu because of this weird facade. Um, it's. It was very grim. It's not a very place, and not not a place you like to go to in the evening. It's really ugly, horrible roof, with parking. Uh, yeah, it was, of course. Yeah, we're talking again about urban heating. This is a spot where a lot of heat would enter the city. So everybody knew that it, something needed to happen. Um, I'm not going to explain that too much in detail, but it's basically we, we reorganized the program together with the the, the client, a large uh, retail developer from France and the Netherlands. Uh, basically, a bit, more a bit less uh, parking and shopping and a bit more retail, a bit more public program, of course, more green. Um, optimizing the routing and making the roof accessible. And that was the, the intention that we have. And then, of course, keeping the base of the building, but also adding here and there an additional part in the same language. Uh, so these parts are new, and they give this excess part to, to the roof, and then the, the, the main part of the building is existing, and these additional elements are uh, extensions. And here you see the, what it was before, and that we try to make it more accessible, more green, more active, so that it becomes a more, more exciting place, instead of this ugly, uh, unattractive no-man's land. Um, the decks made it possible to have more uh, F&B on higher floors, and so the whole place yeah, became more, more exciting and three-dimensional. And again, roof gardens, placing to hang out. So, uh, with, but, but at the same time, keeping that, that typical signature facade, where we developed uh, a new um, facade based on the old facade, but then transforming it from opaque and in a gradient from opaque to just kind of small concrete rings that we glued on the facade so that you have this potential to that kind of with a magic magic stick open the facade that it evaporates and, and that the concrete rings disappear. So that was the principle. And some pictures of, uh, of course, that, that made it suddenly possible that, that, that the whole win these windows, these urban windows would appear. You would be invited to go inside, but it's still the same old 70s big shopping center. We didn't demolish it. And it's still, I think that, that was a, it's a recipe for future transformations. Even how ugly the building it can be, how, how it, there's always a chance to make it exciting, to make it new again, and to keep it as much as possible. Um, I have a few more. Um, Roskilde School, which is another transformation project in Denmark that we did together with uh, Kobe, um, old friends, former uh, staff members of MVDV. Um, and together we, we, we joined a competition for this exciting place, which is um, um, Roskilde is not too far from Copenhagen. Uh, but everybody knows it uh, as it is the base for the, for, the, for, the, for the rock festival in summer. One of the biggest in Northern Europe, already more than 50 years it takes place here, and everybody knows it in Denmark. And what's happening then is that the, the city, um, it's around 120,000 people. It doubles in size for a couple of weeks, um, and that's, that's a kind of magic moment, and then the whole city is completely different. And, and the city uh, wanted to keep some of that, that festival vibe uh, to, throughout the year. So there were like, let's say, 50 weeks of, of let's say nothingness and then two weeks of excitement. So 
can't we give, keep something of the festival atmosphere alive? They bought a former concrete factory uh, located between the festival area and the center. And they asked, they had a competition to add a rock museum and a school and some additional facilities. And this is our competition entry. Uh, it was built so the rock museum, inspired, let's say, by the, by the certain aesthetics of rock music and the studs, the leather belt studs, but also the musical suitcases. Um, and it's a, it's, an, it's a museum for not only rock mu museum, mu music, but also for youth culture throughout the years. So uh, you can, the, from the 50s to, to now, so from rock and roll to the prog rock to house music, electro, whatever. So every generation has something to discover. So grandparents go there with their grandchildren. Uh, so it's an interesting building to visit uh, on a family trip. Um, the flight cases inspiration, were an inspiration for the, the furniture here. Uh, some impressions of the, of the rock museum. But I'd like to, to explain actually the other building that we did, the school. It's a former uh, uh, hall, an industrial hall next to the concrete factory, built out of elements that were made in the concrete factory. So we kept the skeleton. This is how it looked. We couldn't keep the facade. It was too complicated to uh, replace and to keep these, uh, these elements, uh, uh, let's say, alive. Um, but we kept the main structure. Uh, you see already that the space has a potential. It has this really uh, a certain height, a certain uh, atmosphere that's, that was there because of the, the, the weird elements of these prefab concrete pieces. And this was the base, the, the amount of cubic meters where we had added this uh, festival high school, which is a sort of uh, in between high school and university. Um, people could go. Uh, to stay, let's say, half a year or a year at the festival hi high school to develop what they want to do in life. Uh, it could be theater, it could be dance, it could be leadership, philosophy, um, whatever. Um, so it's a sort of um, stage where, you, where in between, uh, uh, we, if you don't know what, what to do, you go to the, to the festival high school and then after a few months you might know what, what you're good at. Um, so. We thought it would be interesting to develop this, so these different uh, practical rooms, let's say, for uh, certain activities with either head, hand, or heart. And then in between, there would be the collective space. And each of these rooms ha would have a certain specific function, either for dancing, for wor as a workshop, uh, a cl normal classroom, or a music studio, performance space. So we would have their own specific interiors. Here is an art space, workshop space, studio. Uh, classroom or lecture hall and, and in between there would be the, the, the sort of the, the streets, the, 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 the meeting spaces where the, which could be used for, for anything. There you have the old uh, structure again, very neutral facade and, and ceiling, acoustics and, and so on were done and then the, all the colors were, were added by the specific functional boxes from the, from the activities that, that would take place. Some impressions of that space. So usually around 100 um, students join per semester and they will also live on campus uh, uh, next door. There's a small dormitory that we also designed. So that's the building, now, uh, how it looks after the transformation next to the rock museum. And here's the overview of the master plan. These are the dorms. Uh, so it is, when you go there on a regular day, there's also, there, there is a certain vibe, which is quite exciting to see. Um, I heard one, go, one more go, is a project that was more or less inspired by it in a way. So it's a building like this school, which is a very simple, s neutral structure, but it's a perfect structure for, for a school and was never intended to be. Can we make buildings that, that have that potential, like our own office that we, that we work in in uh, Rotterdam? It has a, a potential that, 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 that it can add and absorb all kind of um, functionalities. So this was a, a building that is standing on a former factory area in Munich, where they uh, uh, produce potato products, uh, used to produce that. The production went out, the buildings were kept, and they were a base for uh, um, yeah, future development, cre creating a sort of um, uh, yeah, mixture of um, creative working areas, performance spaces, uh, but also public and retail and F&B uh, and theater activities. So here you see that, that building, how it, was, how it used to be, they had some ideas to make it nice and clean, but in, in the end they actually changed it into a more colorful uh, look and that was actually inspired by the informality in, for the in-between use of the whole thing. It was a kind of 
culture factory uh, bet between the, 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 the potato production left and, and the transformation happened. It was a sort of informal uh, um, factory area. And that atmosphere was actually quite nice. And, and this was an inspiration with, to de transform this uh, development in, in the future in, in this way. So here you see a lot of graffiti um, that was all kept. And we were asked to make a new building um, that we like to, um, yeah, and imagine that it could be as cool as, a, as the old buildings that were there. So one of the, the secrets of the old buildings is that the they have, would have high seating heights. So instead of making a building of six floors, we convinced our clients to um, make one floor less, but make every floor higher. So that you could, with a small mezzanine, you could actually make the same amount of square meters, but slightly different. With the fact that the, buildings, the, the floor to ceiling height was higher, the light would come in deeper, and you would not need the central core, but you have a flexible floor. So the building was sort of almost a, yeah, a series of floors, almost like the 111, what do you call it, 1111? 11, a bit like this. So this could be a building uh, like that, similar um, seating, floor to ceiling height, except no cars. Um, here we have F&B, we have fitness spaces, we have offices, but we also have a big apartment. So it's a function neutral building, um, where the inside is in a way, the interior can be, can be adapted by the, by the users. Um, and the exterior, actually we added this additional layer of um, yeah, art, you could say there was a competition we actually were inspired by, by this diagram that we made. We thought, yeah, it's a super simple diagram with all the words there. Would, would actually be nice as a, as, a, as a facade. So here we had some impressions of that. But ultimately, there was a competition between different artists and, and writers, actually, poets, uh, to add text on the building. And um, the winners were the, the ones that took the Disney language, but then the German version, uh, uh, and added this kind of pu, a, u, u, ha, words uh, on top of the building. Um, so outside, it's, during the day, it's rather neutral and gray. And in the evening, it starts to shine out. You can see that um, big floor to floor height. And then there's kind of cascading stairs all the way down. Central core on the outside. So this is very straightforward. But it, it's, it's really fun to see what's happening on this, in these high spaces. We added a pool in the middle of the building, roof decks. And it adds to this uh, rather informal atmosphere in the, um, in the whole tra transform transformed factory area. Well, is there time for a little movie? Yeah, I think so. Yes. <laughs> So this is a concrete building, but we thought, okay, but because the, the structure is so flexible, we could make it out of concrete because it could last much longer. Um, because the five, five and a half meter high floors, uh, where you can have an in-between in floor, um, there's the existing building next door. The middle three floors are a big fitness club. And um, because of the cantilevering, Balconies, they give quite a lot of shade, so we can make very transparent glass. And um, you can really look through it at night. And because there's no core in the middle. Actually, the client uh, selected us because we did the Hanover Pavilion, the Expo Pavilion in. Um, uh, that we made in 2000, where we also have a cascading stairs. Um, actually, we wanted to bring that building to, to Munich, which was a bit hard. So, we, that's, that's, so these staircases are actually a, a reference to that pavilion. And uh, a little bit to our surprise, we were selected as the best building in, in Germany. Uh, I think the, the jury saw the potential of, well, as, that this was a prototype for a different type of uh, it, uh, yeah, a different typology, so to say, for function-neutral buildings. Um, and this is something that, that we have to, to think about. How can we expand life, the lifespan of a building? Uh, once, if you make a new building, you could already think ahead uh, what the future could be like. Um, last one, uh, a project that we just finished in uh, Mallorca um, for um, 
a very interesting client, um, the family that owns the Camper shoe brand. Um, it's in the neighborhood El Terreno, which is this is a center of Palma Harbor, and this is an interesting, yeah, um, not the coolest, but uh, but a very lively part of, of town, close to the to the to the castle, but also very close to the to the sea, to the Mediterranean. And uh, so the neighborhood is actually, um, yeah, you can see the history of this kind of buildings from, let's say, 1800, uh, large villas on top, the beautiful castle, um, just, and the, small, the, the closer you would get to the harbor, the, the smaller the, the buildings would be. Um, actually, there were lots of, of these large villas from people that were trading with, with, with Cuba, uh, and uh, they became quite uh, wealthy in uh, the Balearics. Um, and in the middle of this neighborhood is a small plaza, Gomila, Plaza Gomila, uh, the village neighborhood, uh, Plaza, you could say here, this picture from the past. Uh, but as, as tourism started to, to, to come, the village changed atmosphere and it became a more, let's say, more nightlife atmosphere. Uh, this is the place to go to at night. Uh, cabarets, festivals, sort of small bars, restaurants, and later on even uh, international guests started to appear. Here we have the, Jimi Hendrix performing at Plaza Gomila. Um, in his velvet pants. Um, and it became also denser and denser um, until yeah, more and more apartments came up with views. Uh, and, and after a certain moment, it became, uh, as other places became more interesting, this became not the best place of town anymore. It was not so safe. There were issues with uh, drugs and there were issues with, the, let's say, the nightlife. It was not so attractive to be there. Uh, but uh, things change and there's always a next step. Um, so the, uh, um, the family from uh, the Fluxa family who owns the Camper brand, they're, they're based in, uh, in Mallorca. They knew and they saw the potential of, of this, this neighborhood. Some of them, they were living nearby. Mm -hmm. So they started to, to obtain small plots, plus a small, a, a, a small shopping center in the middle from the 70s. Um, so in the end, we had seven plots. And for each of these plots, we made a small uh, design. And together, uh, all of them would be different a new uh, atmosphere would appear in this, in this neighborhood. That would be maybe a, a, a first uh, tone for a redevelopment uh, for this part of town. Here an overview. We thought it would be nice to, have, to give every building a different color, different material, different, let's say, uh, design element, a different typology. Most of them are apartments, um, relatively townhouses, small townhouses. Uh, it's, it's the neighborhood is, is, there's a lot of, let's say, people um, from out, outside Spain living, uh, but also younger people that have, that share flats. Um, so they thought it would be interesting to cater for, for them, uh, to offer a different type of urban living. Um, spaces where you can live and work, uh, but also, let's say, uh, compact family houses, uh, houses with big terraces. So we imagined together a whole series of typologies that would that would be uh, that would then land, so to say, uh, on this area. So this is a new. This part is new. This is the transformed shopping center. This is a new uh, block as well. And over here, these are the transformed buildings. So it's like 50-50 old, 50-50 uh, 50 new. So this our, our, our recipe was very simple: a, a different color for each of them, different material for each of them, a different roofscape for each of them and a different uh, temp t housing typology for each of them. Um, a picture of the, of the crossing uh, uh, from the old times. And the first building that we, uh, that we designed was this one. It was inspired by, let's say, the, the shed roofs of, a, of, of the small uh, workshop spaces that were there before, and combined with the, the, the sole of the camper shoe. Um, so it suddenly, said, oh, this, 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 this one had to be blue. And uh, it goes from, from light blue to dark blue. Uh, it's, a, it's a triangular plot. Um, every house is different, again, from, from 2 meter 40 wide to more square and very vertical. Uh, the, the, floors, uh, the, the streets are also different on each side. So it's, it's quite a puzzle, but, uh, and, and we thought it would be nice to, that the tiles of the, of the cladding would also change from very thin for the, for the house the narrow house and more square for the, for the, for the, for the, for the unit over there. And these are some color tests we did with the uh, local uh, ceramic maker. And here you see the final result. So it's, this, it's in a way a super inefficient plot. That's why it was uh, never intensified, you could say. 
but it's also very nice because you have this, uh, this one street sloping down in one way and the other way is, is rising in, in, again on the other side. So you have two, two street levels that, that change as you go up. And um, the typology that is, quite, is quite interesting. So it's, we thought it would be nice that you could live and work here. So this could be an office space. This could be, um, yeah, you could be sharing your flat so, you can, so each flatmate could have a room and then you could have the collective living room and, an, and a, a little roof deck. But you could also use it as a big family house, for instance. So it's a, you could have their own, own entrance over here, and you have another entrance over there. So there's all kinds of ways how you could use this building, this, this unit, with a beautiful roof deck with a view to the castle. This is the narrow one. You see here this collective space, the, the, the living room, kitchen, and then every bedroom has an own bathroom. So you could really live here together uh, as you have to, you don't have to be married, so to say, to, to share a house. So you can have your own life and be flatmates, uh, have a bedroom, bathroom, and meet each other in the kitchen. And in the, the collective uh, project, uh, there's a pool, which is, then on, uh, which is accessible for all the residents that are not in this building, but in, in the collective seven buildings um, with a roof deck. So it's not like one big complex with a pool uh, somewhere there, but somehow it's integrated in, the, in, in a different way. So this is the staircase to the roof. And then, so if you live here, you have the key of this door and you go, go to the roof. And these are again different units. So this building is built out of uh, ramped earth blocks. From the main street, you have, it has three levels. On the, on the other side, it's two levels. And this is it. There you have the 70s shopping center that we transformed. We basically cleaned it up, and, and it has already very interesting ceilings and things like that. So there will be a restaurant over here, an office over there, and it's a public route to the neighborhood above. We added a staircase, so it became more a small, small addition to the plaza. Next to this one is the red one, the red houses, and, and it's red because this is the building that used to be there before. So it's a small structure, quite old but in a bad state, it was demolished. So it's okay, let's keep the color. Let's look for traditional uh, style of architecture, but with an extreme, yeah, and reinforcement into say it, make it super red and make it really bright uh, and make it more dense, of course. We really try to optimize the square meters, so it's almost completely filled. Uh, so you have, a, again, a corner house, small houses that go around and sometimes. So it's, there are small townhouses with patios, and each house would have a slightly different color. And everyone would have a roof, deck, again, it's maybe with a big shower, uh, and some plants. Um, and so super warm maybe in the summer, but then you would have a, a cool patio um, downstairs. So it would be an interesting way of, of living in, a, in the Mediterranean climate. This is the final result. Uh, some ideas about the details, I'm not going to explain too much. So, and here's this idea, so you have sometimes glass floors in the patio, again for these collective workspaces and at, at the bottom. So we, we didn't make basements, but we had make these basements with light so you can use them in different ways. You can make it into a music space or ping pong table or a, 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 a small office. Uh, so you have this cool, uh, cool and quiet shaded patio and a, and a sun deck on top. That's the story. All right, here we are. I hope you liked the talk. And in case you have questions, <laughs> The first, who has the first question? Okay. <laughs> if you have any questions, I think Professor Great Reed wants to go first. Uh, you use color quite a lot yeah. in your work, and I wondered if, you, if there was a, a particular approach that you take. <coughs> yeah, we have, uh, maybe I showed a couple of colorful ones. We also have sometimes more neutral, uh, depends a bit, uh, but, but, in, but I think. It, it, it does have a big impact on the on the atmosphere and uh, is as, as the, how the neighborhood was before. It was all kind of beige and brownie and, and sort of uh, and this part by making it colorful, it's clear that this is the this is a new a new a new center. Um, and of course, there was discussion. Some people said, "Wow, why do we need a blue house here?" 
Yeah, it's then there's a bit a bit strange re reason to say yeah, there's not a real reason anymore to make it blue. It could have been other way, but, but after we we started, we said okay, let's make them all different, and that that was also the fun part of it. Yeah, but yeah, and, and in, in in a different context, uh, yeah, it, 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 it's it's somehow it makes me slightly more happy when I have a bit more color uh, in life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is a bit weird. One second. I, I, I do have a question. Okay. Um, okay. So Jacob, you are one of the three founders mm -hmm. of MBRDB, mm -hmm. and the three of you went to college together. Yeah. At some point, you were college students, like mm -hmm. students, and from those days to today, having a firm of 300 and plus mm -hmm. employees working in across the globe, like in every city, every country, every continent. Um, hello. Yeah, so, so it's, it's, a, it's a question about the origins of MBRE. Mm -hmm. Three uh, college friends from TU Delft right, founded, founded this firm, right, after working for Mechano mm -hmm. at some point, right, and today, right, 30 years after? Yeah, 30 August. years after, yeah. Um, having a firm of 300 plus employees, having uh, offices in different countries, working in every continent. How does it feel? I mean, for our students. Yeah. Now <laughs> of course, we never. I never thought that I would give lectures here in Miami. Of course, no. no but of course, this, this is a, a, a step, step by step. And I think we had, we were in a way lucky that there was a certain momentum in the Netherlands where uh, there was a potential for to do to do other things. To, to do other things. I think in architecture was, a, yeah, things were um, the, the, to be to, to be new to be to do, do something different was good. And normally, as an architect, you have to have experience, and you have to uh, sort of you, know, you have to be taken very seriously. And, and somehow, there was a sort of window of opportunity you know, where we where we could step into, um, uh, and, and there was a certain mood. And then, after we built our first buildings, things started to one, one thing led to the to, to the next. We had this expo building in Hanover, which was a big uh, international success. And then we started to work in different countries. Um, yeah, but it, it all started with a competition and t that we did together and in our evening hours next to the office work. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we, we started to organize the office a little bit different. By, uh, some, uh, there's, the architecture is, is quite a rich profession. Huh? So you have people that are very good in talking. Some people can actually really design very well. Others can, can make fantastic images. Some people are very technical. Uh, so it's interesting to give the, 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 the staff the right, the right the, the certain, that have certain skills that, that they can specialize themselves. And, as the firm was a bit larger, we could have certain groups that could specialize themselves in certain topics. And one thing that, that we found out is that, that by combining, uh, let's say, the, the, the computer nerds, so to say, with the climate people, uh, an interesting, interesting match happened. And that that's, that's, was something that we did a few years ago. And uh, they became uh, maybe the most interesting corner in the office. Everybody started to, yeah, it's, it's discovering them, I think, in a certain way. Uh, if there's a certain issue, design issue or task that they can, and they, they are problem solvers in that respect. And uh, of course, everybody works with computers, but some people are have a certain, um, they really dive into it. And then other, they have the production, they, they have people draw with computers and they have the BIM and they have all kind of software, of course. Um, but but for, in, they have a different corner. It's a bit like a, like a unit in, in the office. That is, uh, right now, the office is quite busy, so you cannot really choose the one anymore. So you just have to go to the, to the green one, and that's the only one free. Yeah. Um, and, but that's a nice collection, I think. We have a blue foam one. That, and we have a white one, of course. Uh, and we have a corporate one in blue. And we have an orange one where everybody looks kind of stand. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> One 
thank you so much for the great lecture. I'm an assistant professor here and with a background in architecture, but also interaction design. Mm -hmm. And um, your books, uh, FAR Max and Space Fighter, have uh, also uh, inspired a generation of architects that have started to think about game development and game mm -hmm. design and interaction design as a way of thinking about socio-spatial dynamics. Um, so I was wondering if you can elaborate on maybe uh, play or exploration as part of the design process, because with the books, um, mm -hmm. initially it was about convincing uh, maybe zoning regulations or yeah. policy makers, but eventually it's been a methodology that's really effective. Yeah. Yeah, true. You could you could see it, for instance, in the in the project we did for the for the roof scape, uh, which is in a way based on the same principles in a certain way that you can actually, yeah, test and, and play with with all kind of parameters, and then you see the spatial effect of that. And I think that's uh, yeah, as architecture, yeah, there's always an element of space. I think, and it can be a small, big space, and this kind of spatial thinking. I think, and combine that with interaction tools. I think that could be a, a, a very useful. Uh, planning device, and, uh, but it's not that we use it in every project, it's, it's certain urban projects it works very well, but um, also in research studios and, and, and I think therefore it's, I think it's good for educational projects where you can have a certain um, scenario thinking and you can then extreme, make extreme solutions and ideas, but then use the tools of the computational tools to, to visualize them. Yeah. Well, it, it works a bit different. I think um, um, yeah, there's a certain design methodology that, that we have in the office uh, that where we indeed try to find out the best solution by, by having a series of options. And sometimes you can, well, maybe in the old days we made all different different models and we then start to play with them. It, it's slightly different, I think, now because yeah, people work with, more with computers, uh, but also with 3D. Uh, to, so it's a mixture somehow of intu intuitive design and more uh, straight and more let's say, rational uh, approach. So you can, with the parameters and, say, the parametric way of designing, you, there's a kind of information that, or data that generates something, but at the same time you should also find yeah, this kind of intuitive way of working. And by combining the two, I think, yeah, sometimes magic happens, or sometimes you don't find the right solution, but um, I think that's an interesting way of thinking, and I think some people are more rational, others are more intuitive. Some projects are more rational, and others are more intuitive. It's always, a, but it's always a mix of the two. Yeah. Last one. Anyone? Oh, in the back, or maybe. <laughs> Well, it's a big, big topic, I think. And it's, not, it's not an easy answer. Um, but I think on, on, a, on an urban scale, I think there's many, many issues that, that, that are, um, yeah, are, are coming together. So how to, how to, how to create spaces where uh, can be can be buffer spaces, can be uh, green spaces, can be kind of uh, so it can also be interesting as uh, social spaces. How, how that, that make the city attractive, but also more resilient. Um, and of course, in, on a building level, we could imagine, yeah, of course, right now it happens a lot that a building is maybe 50 years old and then it's on the right spot and they make a new one, it's bigger and better and more expensive. Yeah, it, that's a recipe that it's understandable, but it's, it's it, for a certain commercial point of view, but it's not, it doesn't really feel good. Okay? So, so ultimately, we should try to say, think ahead already, say, okay, how can we yeah, avoid that in the in the in the future, that makes makes it. Yeah, I think this is a, a question that we should ask ourselves, but also clients and, and planners. 
that maybe has an effect on the, on the way we design buildings, but it's still, yeah, that's to be, that's to be seen. But I, I think this is, for, at least for me, an important motivation to think, okay, we try to make a building down, but let's imagine that it's there, it's, it, it, that it could work for, for a longer period. Of course, you never really know, it can, can all, the unexpected can always happen, but I think that's sort of build, demolish, and build again, and then demolish, demolish again, and that, that doesn't work for in the long run. Yeah, you can try to integrate them or recycle them, or maybe you, don't, you could maybe demolish them, but then do something with the materials. So I think there's also all kind of interesting and exciting potentials that I think especially architects could develop. And uh, some of you might, might think, oh, this is really a topic. You have some architects also in the Netherlands that are really focusing on transformations and, and on making recycling building materials, so taking buildings apart, and so have the materials and re uh, offer them again to other architects that they, that they can um, use them, reuse them again. So yeah, so but this, you, you have, maybe you should specialize. Uh, you find out what is your your passion. Uh, some people go in computers, otherwise go in material mining. Uh, so I think it's hard to combine everything. So it's interesting that, that, that we have different type of architects. Yeah. All right, like this may be a nice one to end with. Thank you very much. <laughs>